and the countryside around them was as deserted as if the whole human race and most of its animals had been spirited away. Until we came to Steeple Honey. From our road, we had a view of the whole of Steeple Honey as we descended the hill. It clustered at the further end of a stone bridge which arched across a small sparkling river. It was a quiet little place, centred round a sleepy-looking church, and stippled off at its edges with whitewashed cottages. It did not look as if anything had occurred in a century or more to disturb the quiet life under its thatched roofs. But like other villages, it was now without stir or smoke. And then, when we were halfway down the hill, a movement caught my eye. On the left, at the far end of the bridge, one house stood slightly aslant from the road so that it faced obliquely towards us. An inn sign hung from a bracket on its wall, and from the window immediately above that something white was being waved. As we came closer, I could see the man who was leaning out and frantically flagging us with a towel. I judged that he must be blind, otherwise he would have come out into the road to intercept us. He was waving too vigorously for a sick man. I signalled back to Coker and pulled up as we cleared the bridge. The man at the window dropped his towel. He shouted something which I could not hear above the noise of the engines and disappeared. We both switched off. It was so quiet that we could hear the clumping of the man's feet on the wooden stairs inside the house. The door opened, and he stepped out, holding both hands before him. Like lightning, something whipped out of the hedge on his left and struck him. He gave a single high-pitched shout and dropped where he stood. I picked up my shotgun and climbed out of the cab. I circled a little until I could make out the triffid skulking in the shadows of a bush. Then I blew the top off it. Coker was out of his truck too and standing close beside me. He looked at the man on the ground, and then at the shorn triffid. It was... no. Damn it, it can't have been waiting for him, he said. It must just have happened. It couldn't have known he'd come out of that door. I mean... It couldn't. Could it? Or could it? It was a remarkably neat piece of work, I said. Coker turned uneasy eyes on me. Too damn neat. You don't really believe. There's a kind of conspiracy not to believe things about Triffids, I said, and added, There might be more around here. We looked the adjacent cover over carefully and drew blank. I could do with a drink, suggested Coca. But for the dust on the counter, the small bar of the inn looked normal. We poured a whiskey each. Coca downed his in one. He turned a worried look on me. I didn't like that. Not at all, I didn't. You ought to know a lot more about these bloody things than most people, Bill. I mean, it wasn't... It wasn't... I mean, it must just have happened to be there, mustn't it? I think... I began, and I stopped, listening to the staccato drumming outside. I walked over and opened the window. I let the already trimmed triffid have the other barrel, too, this time just above the bowl. The drumming stopped. The trouble about triffids, I said as we poured another drink, is chiefly the things we don't know about them. I told him one or two of Walter's theories. He started. You don't seriously suggest that they're talking when they make that rattling noise. I've never made up my mind, I admitted. I'll go so far as to say I'm sure it's a signal of some sort. But Walter considered it to be real talk, and he did know more about them than anyone else that I know. I ejected the two spent cartridge cases and reloaded. And he actually mentioned their advantage over a blind man. A number of years ago that was, I pointed out. Still... It's a funny coincidence. Impulsive as ever, I said. Pretty nearly any stroke of fate can be made to look like a funny coincidence if you try hard enough and wait long enough. We drank up and turned to go. Coco glanced out of the window. Then he caught my arm and pointed. Two triffids had swayed round the corner and were making for the hedge which had been the hiding place of the first. I waited until they paused and then decapitated both of them. We left by the window, which was out of range of any triffid cover, and looked about as carefully as we approached the lorries. 
Another coincidence? Or were they coming to see what had happened to their pal? Asked Coca. We cleared the village, running on along small cross-country roads. There seemed to me to be more Triffids about now than we had seen on our previous journey. Or was it that I had been made more conscious of them? It might have been that in travelling hitherto chiefly by main roads we had encountered fewer. I knew from experience that they tended to avoid a hard surface, and thought that it perhaps caused them some discomfort in their limb-like roots. Now I began to be convinced that we were seeing more of them, and I started to get an idea that they were not entirely indifferent to us, though it was not possible to be sure whether those that we saw approaching across fields from time to time just happened to be coming in our direction. A more decisive incident occurred when one slashed at me from the hedgerow as I passed. Luckily, it was inexpert in its aim at a moving vehicle. It let fly a moment too soon and left its print in little dots of poison across the windscreen. I was past before it could strike again. But thenceforward, in spite of the warmth, I drove with the near-side window closed. During the past week or more, I had given thought to the Triffids only when I encountered them. Those I had seen at Josella's home had worried me, as had the others that had attacked our group near Hampstead Heath. But most of the time there had been more immediate things to worry about. But looking back now over our trip, the state of things at Tynesham before Miss Durrant had taken steps to clear it up with shotguns, and the condition of the villages we had passed through, I began to wonder just how big a part the Triffids might have been playing in the disappearance of the inhabitants. In the next village, I drove slowly and looked carefully. In several of the front gardens I could see bodies lying as they had evidently lain for some days, and almost always there was a triffid discernible close by. It looked as if the triffids only ambushed in places where there was soft earth for them to dig their roots into while they waited. One seldom saw a body, and never a triffid, in those parts where the house doors opened straight into the street. At a guess, I would say that what had happened in most of the villages was that the inhabitants emerging for food moved in comparative safety while they were in paved areas, but the moment they left them, or even passed close to a garden wall or fence, they stood in danger of the stings slashing out at them. Some would cry out as they were struck, and when they did not come back, those who remained would grow more afraid. Now and then another would be driven out by hunger. A few might be lucky enough to get back, but most would lose themselves and wander on until they dropped or came within range of a triffid. Those who were left might perhaps guess what was happening. Where there was a garden, they might have heard the swish of the sting and known that they faced the alternatives of starvation in the house or the same fate that had overtaken the others who had left it. Many would remain there, living on what food they had while they waited for help that was never going to come. Something like that, must have been the predicament of the man in the inn at Steeple Honey. The likelihood that in the other villages we were passing through there might still be houses in which isolated groups had managed to keep going was not a pleasant thought. It raised again the same kind of question that we had faced in London, the feeling that one should, by all civilised standards, try to find them and do something for them and the frustrating knowledge of the frittering decline which would overtake any such attempt as it had before. The same old question. What could one do with the best will in the world but prolong the anguish? Placate one's conscience for a while again, just to see the result of the effort wasted once more. It was not, I had to tell myself firmly, any good at all going into an earthquake area while the buildings were still falling. The rescue and the salvage had to be done when the tremors had stopped. But reason did not make it easy. The old doctor had been only too right when he stressed the difficulties of mental adaptation. The Triffids were a complication on an unexpected scale. There were, of course, very many nurseries besides our own company's plantations. They raised them for us, for private buyers, or for sale to any number of lesser trades where their derivatives were used, and the majority of them were, for climactic reasons, situated in the south. Nevertheless, if what we had already seen was a fair sample of the way they had broken loose and distributed themselves, they must have been far more numerous than I had supposed. 
the prospect of more of them reaching maturity every day and of the ducked specimens steadily regrowing their stings was far from reassuring. With only two more stops, one for food and the other for fuel, we made good time and ran into Beeminster about half past four in the afternoon. We had come right into the centre of the town without having seen a sign to suggest the presence of the Beadley party. At first glimpse, the place was as void of life as any other we had seen that day. The main shopping street we entered was bare and empty, save for a couple of lorries drawn up on one side. I had led the way down it for perhaps twenty yards when a man stepped out from behind one of the lorries and levelled a rifle. He fired deliberately over my head and then lowered his aim. Chapter 12 Dead End that's the kind of warning I don't debate about. I pulled up. The man was large and fair-haired. He handled his rifle with familiarity. Without taking it out of the aim, he jerked his head twice sideways. I accepted that as a sign to climb down. When I had done so, I displayed my empty hands. Another man, accompanied by a girl, emerged from behind the stationary lorry as I approached it. Coker's voice called from behind me. Better put out that rifle, chum, you're all in the open. The fair man's eyes left mine to search for Coker. I could have jumped in then if I'd wanted to, but I said, He's right. Anyway, we're peaceful. The man lowered his rifle, not quite convinced. Coker emerged from the cover of my lorry, which had hidden his exit from his own. What's the big idea, dog eat dog? He inquired. Only two of you. The second man asked. Coker looked at him. What would you be expecting, a convention? Yes, just two of us. The trio visibly relaxed. A fair man explained. We thought you might be a gang from a city. We've been expecting them here, raiding for food. Oh, said Coker. From which we assume that you've not taken a look at any city lately. If that's your only worry, you might as well forget it. What gangs there are are more likely to be working the other way round, at present. In fact, doing, if I may say so, just what you are. You don't think they'll come? I'm darn sure they won't. He regarded the three. Do you belong to Beadley's lot? He asked. The response was convincingly blank. Pity, said Coker. That'd have been our first real stroke of luck in quite a time. What is or are Beadley's lot? inquired the fair man. I was feeling wilted and dry after some hours in the driving cab with the sun on it. I suggested that we might remove discussion from the middle of the street to some more congenial spot. We passed round their vans through a familiar litter of cases of biscuits, chests of tea, sides of bacon, sacks of sugar, blocks of salt and all the rest of it, to a small bar parlour next door. Over pint pots, Coker and I gave them a short resume of what we'd done and what we knew. Then it was their turn. They were, it seemed, the more active half of a party of six, the other two women and a man being stationed at the house they had taken over for a base. Around the noon of Tuesday the 7th of May, the fair-haired man and the girl with him had been travelling westwards in his car. They'd been on their way to spend a two-weeks holiday in Cornwall, and making pretty good time until a double-decker bus emerged from a turning somewhere near Crew Kern. The car had made contact with it in a decisive way, and the last thing the fair-haired young man remembered was a horrified glimpse of the bus looking as tall as a cliff and heeling over right above them. He had wakened up in bed to find, much as I had, a mysterious silence all about him. Apart from soreness, a few cuts and a thumping head, there didn't appear to be a lot wrong with him. When, as he said, Nobody kept on coming. He had investigated the place and found it to be a small cottage hospital. In one ward he had found the girl and two other women, one of whom was conscious but incapacitated by a leg and an arm in plaster. In another were two men, one of them his present companion, the other suffering from a broken leg also in plaster. Altogether there had been eleven people in the place, eight of whom were sighted. Of the blind, two were bedridden and seriously ill. Of the staff, there was no sign at all. His experience had been, to begin with, more baffling than mine. They had stayed in the little hospital, doing what they could for the helpless, 
wondering what went on and hoping that someone would show up to help. They had no idea what was wrong with the two blind patients nor how to treat them. They could do nothing but feed and try to ease them. Both had died the next day. One man disappeared, and no one had seen him go. Those who were there for injuries suffered when the bus had overturned were local people. Once they were sufficiently recovered, they set out to find relatives. The party had dwindled down to six, two of whom had broken limbs. By now they had realized that the breakdown was big enough to mean that they must fend for themselves for a time at least. But they were still far from grasping its full extent. They decided to leave the hospital and find some more convenient place, for they imagined that many more sighted people would exist in the cities and that disorganization would have brought mob rule. Daily they were expecting the arrival of these mobs when the food stores in the towns should be finished, and had pictured them moving like a locust army across the countryside. Their chief concern, therefore, had been to gather supplies in preparation for a siege. With our assurances that that was the least likely thing to happen, they looked at one another a little bleakly. They were an oddly assorted trio. The fair-haired man turned out to be a member of the stock exchange by the name of Stephen Brennell. His companion was a good-looking, well-built girl with an occasional superficial petulance but no real surprise over whatever life might hand her next. She had led one of those fringe careers, modelling dresses, selling them, putting in movie extra work, missing opportunities of going to Hollywood, hostessing for obscure clubs, and helping out these activities by such other means as offered themselves the intended holiday in Cornwall being apparently one such. She had an utterly unshakable conviction that nothing serious could have happened to America, and that it was only a matter of holding out for a while until the Americans arrived to put everything in order. She was quite the least troubled person I had encountered since the catastrophe took place, though just occasionally she pined a little for the bright lights which she hoped the Americans would hurry up and restore. The third member, the dark young man, nursed a grudge. He had worked hard and saved hard in order to start his small radio store, and he had ambitions. Look at Ford, he told us, and look at Lord Nuffield. He started with a bike shop no bigger than my radio store and see where he got to. That's the kind of thing I was going to do. And now look at the damn mess things are in. It ain't fair. Fate, as he saw it, didn't want any more Fords or Nuffields, but he didn't intend to take that lying down. This was only an interval sent to try him. One day would see him back in his radio store with his foot set firmly on the first rung to millionairedom. The most disappointing thing about them was to find that they knew nothing of the Michael Beadley party. Indeed, the only group they had encountered was in a village just over the Devon border, where a couple of men with shotguns had advised them not to come that way again. Those men, they said, were obviously local. Poker suggested that that meant a small group. If they belonged to a large one, they'd have shown less nervousness and more curiosity, he maintained. But if the Beadley lot around here, we ought to be able to find them somehow. He put it to the fair man. Look here, suppose we come along with you. We can do our whack, and when we do find them, it'll make things easier for all of us. The three of them looked questioningly at one another, and then nodded. All right, give us a hand with the loading and we'll be getting along, the man agreed. By the look of Charcot Old House, it had once been a fortified manor. Re-fortification was now underway. At some time in the past, the encircling moat had been drained. Stephen, however, was of the opinion that he had successfully ruined the drainage system so that it would fill up again by degrees. It was his plan to blow up such parts as had been filled in and thus complete the re-encirclement. Our news, suggesting that this might not be necessary, induced a slight wistfulness in him and a look of disappointment. The stone walls of the house were thick. At least three of the windows in the front displayed machine guns, and he pointed out two more mounted on the roof. Inside the main door was stacked a small arsenal of mortars and bombs, and as he proudly showed us, several flamethrowers. We found an arms depot, he explained, and spent a day getting this lot together. As I looked over the stuff, I realized for the first time that the catastrophe by its very thoroughness had been more merciful than the things that would have followed a slightly lesser disaster. Had ten or fifteen percent of the population remained unharmed, it was very likely that little communities like this would indeed have found themselves fighting off starving gangs in order to preserve their own lives. As things were, however, 
Stephen had probably made his warlike preparations in vain. But there was one appliance that could be put to good use. I pointed to the flamethrowers. Those might be handy for triffids, I said. He grinned. You're right. Very effective. The one thing we've used them for. And incidentally, the one thing I know that really makes a triffid beat it. You can go on firing at them until they're shot to bits and they don't budge. I suppose they don't know where the destruction's coming from. But one warm lick from this and they're plunging off fit to bust themselves. Have you had a lot of trouble with them? I asked. It seemed that they had not. From time to time one, perhaps two or three, would approach and be scorched away. On their expeditions they had had several lucky escapes, but usually they were out of their vehicles only in built-up areas where there was little likelihood of prowling triffids. That night, after dark, we all went up to the roof. It was too early for the moon. We looked out upon an utterly black landscape. Search it as we would, not one of us was able to discover the least pinpoint of a telltale light, nor could any of the party recall ever having seen a trace of smoke by day. I was feeling depressed when we descended again to the lamp-lit living room. There's only one thing for it, then, Coker said. We'll have to divide the district up into areas and search them. But he did not say it with conviction. I suspected that he was thinking it likely as I was that the Beadley party would continue to show a deliberate light by night and some other sign, probably a smoke column, by day. However, no one had any better suggestion to make, so we got down to the business of dividing the map up into sections, doing our best to contrive that each should include some high ground to give an extensive view beyond it. The following day we went into the town in a lorry, and from there dispersed in smaller cars for the search. That was without a doubt, the most melancholy day I had spent since I had wandered about Westminster searching for traces of Josella there. Just at first it wasn't too bad. There was the open road in the sunlight, the fresh green of early summer. There were signposts which pointed to Exeter and the West, and other places as if they still pursued their habitual lives. There were sometimes, though rarely, birds to be seen. And there were wild flowers beside the lanes, looking as they had always looked. But the other side of the picture was not so good. There were fields in which cattle lay dead or wandered blindly, and untended cows lowed in pain, where sheep in their easy discouragement had stood resignedly to die rather than pull themselves free from bramble or barbed wire, and other sheep grazed erratically or starved with looks of reproach in their blind eyes. Farms were becoming unpleasant places to pass closely. For safety's sake, I was giving myself only an inch of ventilation at the top of the window, but I closed even that whenever I saw a farm beside the road ahead. Triffids were at large. Sometimes I saw them crossing fields or noticed them inactive against hedges. In more than one farm they had found the middens to their liking and enthroned themselves there while they waited for the dead stock to attain the right stage of putrescence. I saw them now with a disgust that they had never roused in me before. Horrible, alien things, which some of us had somehow created and which the rest of us in our careless greed had cultured all over the world. One could not even blame nature for them. Somehow they had been bred, just as we bred ourselves beautiful flowers or grotesque parodies of dogs. I began to loathe them now for more than their carrion-eating habits. They, more than anything else, seemed able to profit and flourish on our disaster. As the day went on, my sense of loneliness grew. On any hill or rise I stopped to examine the country as far as field glasses would show me. Once I saw smoke and went to the source to find a small railway train burnt out on the line. I still do not know how that could be, for there was no one near it. Another time a flag upon a staff sent me hurrying to a house to find it silent, though not empty. Yet another time a white flutter of movement on a distant hillside caught my eye. But when I turned the glasses on it, I found it to be half a dozen sheep milling in panic while a triffid struck continually and ineffectively across their woolly backs. Nowhere could I see a sign of living human beings. 
When I stopped for food, I did not linger longer than I needed. I ate it quickly, listening to a silence that was beginning to get on my nerves, and anxious to be on my way again with at least the sound of the car for company. One began to fancy things. Once I saw an arm waving from a window, but when I got there it was only a branch swaying in front of the window. I saw a man stop in the middle of a field and turn to watch me go by, but the glasses showed me that he couldn't have stopped or turned. He was a scarecrow. I heard voices calling to me, just discernible above the engine noise. I stopped and switched off. There were no voices. Nothing. But far, far away, the plaint of an unmilked cow. It came to me that here and there, dotted about the country, there must be men and women who were believing themselves to be utterly alone. Sole survivors. I felt as sorry for them as for anyone else in the disaster. During the afternoon, with lowered spirits and little hope, I kept doggedly on quartering my section of the map because I dared not risk failing to make my inner certainty sure. At last, however, I satisfied myself that if any sizable party did exist in the area I had been allotted, it was deliberately hiding. It had not been possible for me to cover every lane and by-road, but I was willing to swear that the sound of my by no means feeble horn had been heard in every acre of my sector. I finished up and drove back to the place where we had parked the lorry in the gloomiest mood I had yet known. I found that none of the others had shown up yet, so to pass the time, and because I needed it to keep out the spiritual cold, I turned into the nearby pub and poured myself a good brandy. Stephen was the next. The expedition seemed to have affected him as much as it had me, for he shook his head in answer to my questioning look and made straight for the bottle I had opened. Ten minutes later, the radio ambitionist joined us. He brought with him a disheveled, wild-eyed young man who appeared not to have washed or shaved for several weeks. This person had been on the road. It was, it seemed, his only profession. One evening, he could not say for certain of what day, he had found a fine, comfortable barn in which to spend the night. Having done somewhat more than his usual quota of miles that day, he had fallen asleep almost as soon as he lay down. The next morning he had awakened in a nightmare, and he still seemed a little uncertain whether it was the world or himself that was crazy. We reckoned he was, a little anyway, but he still retained a clear knowledge of the use of beer. Another half hour or so passed, and then Coker arrived. He was accompanied by an Alsatian puppy and an unbelievable old lady. She was dressed in what was obviously her best. Her cleanliness and precision were as notable as were the lack of them in our other recruit. She paused with a genteel hesitation on the threshold of the bar parlour. Coker performed the introduction. This is Mrs. Fawcett, sole proprietor of Fawcett's Universal Stores in a collection of about ten cottages, two pubs and a church known as Chippington Durney. And Mrs. Fawcett can cook. Boy, can she cook. Mrs. Fawcett acknowledged us with dignity, advanced with confidence, seated herself with circumspection, and consented to be pressed to a glass of port, followed by another glass of port. In answer to our questions, she confessed to sleeping with unusual soundness during the fatal evening and the night that followed. Into the precise cause of this she did not enter, and we did not inquire. She had continued to sleep since nothing had occurred to awaken her through half the following day. When she awoke she was feeling unwell, and so did not attempt to get up until mid-afternoon. It had seemed to her curious but providential that no one had required her in the shop. When she did get up and go to the door she had seen one of them horrid Triffid things standing in her garden, and a man lying on the path just outside her gate. At least she could see his legs. She had been about to go out to him when she had seen the Triffid stir, and she had slammed the door to just in time. It had clearly been a nasty moment for her, and the recollection of it agitated her into pouring herself a third glass of port. After that, she had settled down to wait until someone should come to remove both the Triffid and the man. They seemed a strangely long time in coming, but she had been able to live comfortably enough upon the contents of her shop. She had still been waiting, she explained as she poured herself a fourth glass of port with a nice absent-mindedness, 
when Coker, interested by the smoke from her fire, had shot the top off the triffid and investigated. She had given Coker a meal, and he in return had given her advice. It had not been easy to make her understand the true state of things. In the end, he had suggested that she should take a look up the village, keeping a wary eye for Triffids, and that he would be back at five o'clock to see how she felt about it. He had returned to find her dressed up, her bag packed, and herself quite ready to leave. Back in Charcot Old House that evening, we gathered again around the map. Coker started to mark out new areas of search. We watched him without enthusiasm. It was Stephen who said what all of us, including, I think, Coker himself, were thinking. Look here, we've been over all the ground for a circle of some fifteen miles between us. It's clear they aren't in the immediate neighbourhood. Either your information is wrong, or they decided not to stop here and went on. In my view, it would be a waste of time to go on searching the way we did today. Coker laid down the compasses he was using. Then what do you suggest? Well, it seems to me we could cover a lot of the district pretty quickly from the air and well enough. You can bet your life that anyone who hears an aircraft engine is going to turn out and make a sign of some kind. Coker shook his head. Now, why didn't we think of that before? It ought to be a helicopter, of course, but where do we get one? And who's going to fly it? Oh, I can make one of them things go all right, said the radio man confidently. There was something in his tone. Have you ever flown one? asked Coker. No, admitted the radio man, but I reckon there'd not be a lot to it once you got the knack. Hmm, said Coker, looking at him with reserve. Stephen recalled the locations of two RAF stations not too far away, and that there had been an air taxi business operating from Yeovil. End of Disc 6 Disc 7 In spite of our doubts, the radio man was as good as his word. He seemed to have complete confidence that his instinct for mechanism would not let him down. After practising for half an hour, he took the helicopter off and flew it back to Charcot. For four days, the machine hovered around in widening circles. On two of them, Coker observed. On the other two, I replaced him. In all, we discovered ten little groups of people. None of them knew anything of the Beadley party, and none of them contained Josella. As we found each lot, we landed. Usually they were in twos and threes. The largest was seven. They would greet us in hopeful excitement, but soon when they found that we represented only a group similar to their own, and were not the spearhead of a rescue party on the grand scale, their interest would lapse. We could offer them little that they had not got already. Some of them became irrationally abusive and threatening in their disappointment, but most simply dropped back into despondency. As a rule, they showed little wish to join up with other parties, and were inclined rather to lay hands on what they could, building themselves into refugees as comfortably as possible while they waited for the arrival of the Americans who were bound to find a way. There seemed to be a widespread and fixed idea about this. Our suggestions that any surviving Americans would be likely to have their hands more than full at home was received as so much wet blanketry. The Americans, they assured us, would never have allowed such a thing to happen in their country. Nevertheless, and in spite of this Micawber fixation on American fairy godmothers, we left each party with a map showing them the approximate positions of groups we had already discovered in case they should change their minds and think about getting together for self-help. As a task, the flights were far from enjoyable, but at least they were to be preferred to lonely scouting on the ground. However, at the end of the fruitless fourth day, it was decided to abandon the search. At least, that was what the rest of them decided. I did not feel the same way about it. My quest was personal, theirs was not. Whoever they found, now or eventually, would be strangers to them. I was searching for Beadley's party as a means, not an end in itself. If I should find them and discover that Gisela was not with them, then I should go on searching but I could not expect the rest to devote any more time to searching purely on my behalf. Curiously, I realised that in all this I had met no other person who was searching for someone else, 
Every one of them had been, save for the accident of Stephen and his girlfriend, snapped clean away from friends or relatives to link him with the past, and was beginning a new life with people who were strangers. Only I, as far as I could see, had promptly formed a new link, and that so briefly that I had scarcely been aware how important it was to me at the time. Once the decision to abandon the search had been taken, Coker said, All right, then that brings us to thinking about what we're going to do for ourselves. Which means laying in stores against the winter and just going on as we are. What else should we do? asked Stephen. I've been thinking about that, Coker told him. Maybe it'd be all right for a while, but what happens afterwards? Well, if we do run short of stocks, well, there's plenty more lying around, said the radio man. The Americans will be here before Christmas, said Stephen's girlfriend. Listen, Coker told her patiently, just put the Americans in the jam tomorrow pie in the sky department a while, will you? Try to imagine a world in which there aren't any Americans. Can you do that? The girl stared at him. But there must be, she said. Coker sighed sadly. He turned his attention to the radio man. There won't always be those stores. The way I see it, we've been given a flying start in a new kind of world. We're endowed with a capital of enough of everything to begin with. But that isn't going to last forever. We couldn't eat up all the stuff that's there for the taking, not in generations. If it would keep. But it isn't going to keep. A lot of it's going to go bad pretty rapidly. And not only food, everything is going, more slowly but quite surely, to drop in pieces. If we want fresh stuff to eat next year, we shall have to grow it ourselves. And it may seem a long way off now, but there's going to come a time when we shall have to grow everything ourselves. There'll come a time, too, when all the tractors are worn out or rusted, and there's no more petrol to run them anyway. When we'll come right down to nature and bless horses, if we've got them. This is a pause, just a heaven-sent pause while we get over the first shock and start to collect ourselves. But it's no more than a pause. Later, we'll have to plough. Still later, we'll have to learn how to make plough shares. Later than that, we'll have to learn how to smelt iron to make the shares. What we are on now is a road that will take us back and back and back until we can, if we can, make good all that we wear out. Not until then shall we be able to stop ourselves on the trail that's leading down to savagery. But once we can do that, then maybe we'll begin to crawl slowly up again. He looked round the circle to see if we were following him. We can do that, if we will. The most valuable part of our flying start is knowledge. That's the shortcut to save us starting where our ancestors did. We've got it all there in the books if we take the trouble to find out about it. The rest were looking at Coco curiously. It was the first time they had heard him in one of his oratorical moods. Now, he went on, from my reading of history... The thing you have to have to use knowledge is leisure. Where everybody has to work hard just to get a living and there is no leisure to think, knowledge stagnates and people with it. The thinking has to be done largely by people who are not directly productive, by people who appear to be living almost entirely on the work of others, but are, in fact, a long-term investment. Learning grew up in the cities and in great institutions, it was the labour of the countryside that supported them. Do you agree with that? Stephen knitted his brows. More or less, but I don't see what you're getting at. It's this, the economic size. A community of our present size cannot hope to do more than exist and decline. If we stay here as we are now, just ten of us now, the end is quite inevitably a gradual and useless fade-out. If there are children, we shall be able to spare only enough time from our labour to give them just a rudimentary education. One generation further and we shall have savages or clods. To hold our own, to make any use at all of the knowledge in the libraries, we must have the teacher, the doctor and the leader. And we must be able to support them while they help us. Well, said Stephen, after a pause. I've been thinking of that place Bill and I saw at Tynesham. We've told you about it. The woman who's tried to run it wanted help, and she wanted it badly. She has about fifty or sixty people on her hands, and a dozen or so of them able to see. That way, she can't do it. She knows she can't, but she wasn't going to admit it to us. She wasn't going to put herself in our debt by asking us to stay. 
but she'd be very glad if we were to go back there after all and ask to be admitted. Good Lord, I said. You don't think she deliberately put us on the wrong track? I don't know. I might be doing her an injustice, but it is an odd thing that we've not seen or heard a single sign of Beadley and Co., isn't it? Anyhow, whether she meant it or not, that's the way it works, because I've decided to go back there. If you want my reasons, here they are. Two main ones. First, unless that place is taken in hand, it's going to crash, which would be a waste and a shame for all those people there. The other is that it's much better situated than this. It has a farm, which should not take a lot of putting in order. It is practically self-contained, but could be extended if necessary. This place would cost a lot more labour to start and to work. More important, it is big enough to afford time for teaching. Teaching both the present blind there and the sighted children they'll have later on. I believe it can be done, and I'll do my best to do it, and if the haughty Miss Durrant can't take it, she can go and jump in the river. Now, the point is this. I think I could do it as it stands. But I know that if the lot of us were to go, we could get the place reorganised and running in a few weeks. Then we'd be living in a community that's going to grow and make a damn good attempt to hold its own. The alternative is to stay in a small party which is going to decline and get more desperately lonely as time goes on. So, how about it? There was some debate and inquiry for details, but not much doubt. Those of us who had been out on the search had a glimpse of the awful loneliness that might come. No one was attached to the present house. It had been chosen for its defensible qualities, and had little more to commend it. Most of them could feel the oppression of isolation growing round them already. The thought of wider and more varied company was in itself attractive. The end of an hour found the discussion dealing with questions of transport and details of the removal, and the decision to adopt Coker's suggestion had more or less made itself. Only Stephen's girlfriend was doubtful. This place, Tynesham, is pretty much off the map, she asked uneasily. Don't you worry, Coker reassured her. It's marked on all the best American maps. It was some time in the early hours of the following morning that I knew I was not going to Tynesham with the rest. Later, perhaps I would, but not yet. My first inclination had been to accompany them, if only for the purpose of choking the truth out of Miss Durrant regarding the Beadley party's destination. But then I had to make again the disturbing admission that I did not know that Josella was with them, and indeed that all the information I had been able to collect so far suggested that she was not. She had pretty certainly not passed through Tynesham. But if she had not gone in search of them, then where had she gone? It was scarcely likely that there had been a second direction in the university building, one that I had missed. And then, as if it had been a flash of light... I recalled the discussion we had had in our commandeered flat. I could see her sitting there in her blue party frock, with the light of the candles catching the diamonds as we talked. What about the Sussex Downs? I know a lovely old farmhouse on the north side. And then I knew what I must do. I told Coker about it in the morning. He was sympathetic, but obviously anxious not to raise my hopes too much. OK. You do as you think best, he agreed. I hope... Well, anyway, you know where we are, and you can both come on to Tynesham and help to put that woman through the hoop until she sees sense. That morning the weather broke. The rain was falling in sheets as I climbed once more into the familiar lorry. Yet I was feeling elated and hopeful. It could have rained ten times harder without depressing me or altering my plan. Coco came out to see me off. I knew why he made a point of it, for I was aware without his telling me that the memory of his first rash plan and its consequences troubled him. He stood beside the cab with his hair flattened and the water trickling down his neck, and held up his hand. Take it easy, Bill. There aren't any ambulances these days and she'll prefer you to arrive all in one piece. Good luck. And my apologies for everything to the lady, when you find her. The word was when but the tone was if. I wished them well at Tynesham, then I let in the clutch and splashed away down the muddy drive. Chapter 13 Journey in Hope The morning was infected with minor mishaps. First it was water in the carburettor, 
Then I contrived to travel a dozen miles north under the impression I was going east, and before I had that fully rectified, I was in trouble with the ignition system on a bleak upland road miles from anywhere. Either these delays or a natural reaction did a lot to spoil the hopeful mood in which I had started. By the time I had the trouble straightened out, it was one o'clock, and the day had cleared up. The sun came out. Everything looked bright and refreshed, but even that, and the fact that for the next twenty miles all went smoothly, did not shift the mood of depression that was closing over me again. Now I was really on my own. I could not shut out the sense of loneliness. It came upon me again as it had on that day when we had split up to search for Michael Beadley, only with double the force. Until then, I had always thought of loneliness as something negative, an absence of company, and of course something temporary. That day, I had learned that it was much more. It was something which could press and oppress, could distort the ordinary and play tricks with the mind. Something which lurked inimically all around, stretching the nerves and twanging them with alarms, never letting one forget that there was no one to help, no one to care. It showed one as an atom adrift in vastness, and it waited all the time its chance to frighten and frighten horribly. That was what loneliness was really trying to do, and that was what one must never let it do. To deprive a gregarious creature of companionship is to maim it, to outrage its nature. The prisoner and the cenobite are aware that the herd exists beyond their exile; they are an aspect of it. But when the herd no longer exists, there is for the herd creature no longer entity. He is a part of no whole, a freak without a place. If he cannot hold on to his reason, then he is lost indeed. Most. Utterly, most fearfully lost, so that he becomes no more than the twitch in the limb of a corpse. It needed far more resistance now than it had before. Only the strength of my hope that I would find companionship at my journey's end kept me from turning back to find relief from the strain in the presence of Coker and the others. The sights which I saw by the way had little or nothing to do with it. Horrible though some of them were. I was hardened to such things by now. The horror had left them, just as the horror which broods over great battlefields fades into history. Nor did I any longer see these things as part of a vast, impressive tragedy. My struggle was all a personal conflict with the instincts of my kind, a continual defensive action, with no victory possible. I knew in my very heart that I would not be able to sustain myself for long alone. To give myself occupation, I drove faster than I should. In some small town with a forgotten name, I rounded a corner and ran straight into a van which blocked the whole street. Luckily, my own tough lorry suffered no more than scratches, but the two vehicles managed to hitch themselves together with diabolical ingenuity, so that it was an awkward business, single-handed and in a confined space, to separate them. It was a problem which took me a full hour to solve, and did me good by turning my mind to practical matters. After that, I kept to a more cautious pace, except for a few minutes soon after I entered the new forest. The cause of that was a glimpse through the trees of a helicopter cruising at no great height. It was set to cross my course some way ahead. By ill luck, the trees there grew close to the sides of the road and must have hidden it almost completely from the air. I put on a spurt, but by the time I reached more open ground, the machine was no more than a speck floating away in the distance to the north. Nevertheless, even the sight of it seemed to give me some support. A few miles further on, I ran through a small village which was disposed neatly about a triangular green. At first sight, it was as charming in its mixture of thatched and red-tiled cottages with their flowering gardens as something out of a picture book. But I did not look too closely into the gardens as I passed. Too many of them showed the alien shape of a triffid towering incongruously among the flowers. I was almost clear of the place when a small figure bounded out of one of the last garden gates and came running up the road towards me, waving both arms. I pulled up, looking around for Triffids in a way that was becoming instinctive, picked up my gun and climbed down. The child was dressed in a blue cotton frock, white socks, and sandals. She looked about nine or ten years old. 
a pretty little girl. I could see that even though her dark brown curls were now uncared for and her face dirtied with smeared tears. She pulled at my sleeve. Please, please, she said urgently. Please come and see what's happened to Tommy. I stood staring down at her. The awful loneliness of the day lifted. My mind seemed to break out of the case I had made for it. I wanted to pick her up and hold her to me. I could feel tears close behind my eyes. I held up my hand to her, and she took it. Together we walked back to the gate through which she had gone. Tommy's there, she said, pointing. A little boy about four years of age lay on the diminutive patch of lawn between the flower beds. It was quite obvious at a glance why he was there. The thing hit him, she said. It hit him and he fell down, and it wanted to hit me when I tried to help him. Horrible thing. I looked up and saw the top of a triffid rising above the fence that bordered the garden. Put your hands over your ears, I'm going to make a bang, I said. She did so, and I blasted the top off the triffid. Horrible thing, she repeated. Is it dead now? I was about to assure her that it was when it began to rattle the little sticks against its stem just as the one at Steeple Honey had done. As then, I gave it the other barrel to shut it up. Yes, I said. It's dead now. We walked across to the little boy. The scarlet slash of the sting was vivid on his pale cheek. It must have happened some hours before. She knelt beside him. It isn't any good. I told her gently. She looked up, fresh tears in her eyes. Is Tommy dead too? I squatted down beside her and shook my head. I'm afraid he is. After a while, she said, Poor Tommy. Will we bury him? Like the puppies? Yes, I told her. In all the overwhelming disaster, that was the only grave I dug. And it was a very small one. She gathered a little bunch of flowers and laid them on top of it. Then we drove away. Susan was her name. A long time ago, as it seemed to her, something had happened to her father and mother so that they could not see. Her father had gone out to try and get some help and he had not come back. Her mother went out later, giving the children strict instructions not to leave the house. She had come back crying. The next day she went out again. This time she did not come back. The children had eaten what they could find and then began to grow hungry. At last Susan was hungry enough to disobey instructions and seek help from Mrs. Walton at the shop. The shop itself was open, but Mrs. Walton was not there. No one came when Susan called, so she had decided to take some cakes and biscuits and sweets and tell Mrs. Walton about it later. She had seen some of the things about as she came back. One of them had struck at her, but it had misjudged her height and the sting had passed over her head. It frightened her, and she ran the rest of the way home. After that she had been very careful about the things, and on further expeditions had taught Tommy to be careful about them too. But Tommy had been so little, he had not been able to see the one that was hiding in the next garden when he went out to play that morning. Susan had tried half a dozen times to get to him, but each time, however careful she was, she had seen the top of the triffid tremble and stir slightly. An hour or so later I decided it was time to stop for the night. I left her in the truck while I prospected a cottage or two until I found one that was fit, and then we set about getting a meal together. I did not know much of small girls, but this one seemed to be able to dispose of an astonishing quantity of the result, confessing while she did so that a diet consisting almost entirely of biscuits, cake and sweets had proved less completely satisfying than she had expected. After we had cleaned her up a bit, and I, under instruction, had wielded her hairbrush, I began to feel rather pleased with the results. She, for her part, seemed able for a time to forget all that had happened in her pleasure at having someone to talk to. I could understand that. I was feeling exactly the same way myself. 
but not long after I had seen her to bed and come downstairs again, I heard the sound of sobbing. I went back to her. It's all right, Susan, I said. It's all right. It didn't really hurt, poor Tommy, you know. It was so quick. I sat down on the bed beside her and took her hand. She stopped crying. It wasn't just Tommy, she said. It was after Tommy, when there was nobody, nobody at all. I was so frightened. I know, I told her. I do know. I was frightened, too. She looked up at me. But you aren't frightened now? No, and you aren't either. So you see, we'll just have to keep together to stop one another being frightened. Yes, she agreed with serious consideration. I think that'll be all right. So we went on to discuss a number of things, until she fell asleep. Where are we going? Susan asked as we started off again the following morning. I said that we were looking for a lady. Where is she? asked Susan. I wasn't sure of that. When shall we find her? asked Susan. I was pretty unsatisfactory about that, too. Is she a pretty lady? asked Susan. Yes, I said, glad to be more definite this time. It seemed for some reason to give Susan satisfaction. Good, she remarked approvingly, and we passed to other subjects. Because of her, I tried to skirt the larger towns, but it was impossible to avoid many unpleasant sights in the country. After a while, I gave up pretending that they did not exist. Susan regarded them with the same detached interest as she gave to the normal scenery. They did not alarm her, though they puzzled her and prompted questions. Reflecting that the world in which she was going to grow up would have little use for the over-niceties and euphemisms that I had learnt as a child, I did my best to treat the various horrors and curiosities in the same objective fashion. That was really very good for me, too. By midday the clouds had gathered, and the rain began once more. When at five o'clock we had pulled up on the road just short of Pulborough, it was still pouring hard. Where do we go now? inquired Susan. That, I acknowledged, is just the trouble. It's somewhere over there. I waved my arm towards the misty line of the downs to the south. I had been trying hard to recall just what else Josella had said of the place, but I could remember no more than that the house stood on the north side of the hills, and I had the impression that it faced across the low, marshy country that separated them from Pulborough. Now that I had come so far, it seemed a pretty vague instruction. The downs stretched away for miles to the east and to the west. Maybe the first thing to do is see if we can find any smoke across there, I suggested. It's awfully difficult to see anything at all in the rain, Susan said, practically and quite rightly. Half an hour later the rain obligingly held off for a while. We left the lorry and sat on a wall side by side. We studied the lower slopes of the hills carefully for some time, but neither Susan's sharp eyes nor my field glasses could discover any trace of smoke or signs of activity. Then it started to rain again. I'm hungry, said Susan. Food was a matter of trifling interest to me just then. Now that I was so near, my anxiety to know whether my guess had been right overcame everything else. While Susan was still eating, I took the lorry a little way up the hill behind us to get a more extensive view. In between showers and in a worsening light, we scanned the other side of the valley again without result. There was no life or movement in the whole valley save for a few cattle and sheep and an occasional triffid lurching across the field below. An idea came to me, and I decided to go down to the village. I was reluctant to take Susan, for I knew the place would be unpleasant, but I could not leave her where she was. When we got there, I found that the sights affected her less than they did me. Children have a different convention of the fearful until they have been taught the proper things to be shocked at. The depression was all mine, Susan found more to interest than to disgust her. Any somberness was quite offset by her delight in a scarlet silk mackintosh with which she equipped herself in spite of it being several sizes too large. My search, too, was rewarding. 
I returned to the lorry laden with a headlamp like a minor searchlight, which we had found upon an illustrious-looking Rolls-Royce. I rigged the thing up on a kind of pivot beside the cab window and made it ready to plug in. When that was fixed, there was nothing to do but wait for darkness and hope that the rain would let up. By the time it was fully dark, the raindrops had become a mere spatter. I switched on and sent a magnificent beam piercing the night. Slowly I turned the lamp from side to side, keeping its ray leveled towards the opposite hills, while I anxiously tried to watch the whole line of them simultaneously for an answering light. A dozen times or more I traversed it steadily, switching off for a few seconds at the end of each sweep while we sought the least flicker in the darkness. But each time the night over the hills remained pitchy black. Then the rain came on more heavily again. I set the beam full ahead and sat waiting, listening to the drumming of the drops on the roof of the cab while Susan fell asleep leaning against my arm. An hour passed before the drumming dwindled to a patter and ceased. Susan woke up as I started the beam raking across again. I had completed the sixth travel when she called out, Look! Bill! There it is! There's a light! She was pointing a few degrees left of our front. I switched off the lamp and followed the line of her finger. It was difficult to be sure. If it were not a trick of our eyes, it was something as dim as a distant glowworm. And even as we were looking at it, the rain came down on us again in sheets. By the time I had my glasses in my hand, there was no view at all. I hesitated to move. It might be that the light, if it had been a light, would not be visible from lower ground. Once more I trained our light forward and settled down to wait with as much patience as I could manage. Almost another hour passed before the rain cleared again. The moment it did, I switched off our lamp. It is, Susan cried excitedly. Look, look! It was. And bright enough now to banish any doubts, though the glasses showed me no details. I switched on again and gave the V sign in Morse. It's the only Morse I know except SOS, so it had to do. While we watched the other light, it blinked and then began a series of deliberate longs and shorts, which unfortunately meant nothing to me. I gave a couple more Vs for good measure, drew the approximate line of the far light on our map, and switched on the driving lights. Is that the lady? asked Susan. It's got to be, I said. It's got to be. That was a poorish trip. To cross the low marshland it was necessary to take a road a little to the west of us and then work back to the east along the foot of the hills. Before we had gone more than a mile something cut off the sight of the light from us altogether, and to add to the difficulty of finding our way in the dark lanes the rain began again in earnest. With no one to care for the drainage sluices some fields were already flooded, and the water was over the road in places. I had to drive with a tedious care when all my urge was to put my foot flat down. Once we reached the further side of the valley, we were free of flood water, but we made little better speed, for the lanes were full of primitive wanderings and improbable turns. I had to give the wheel all my attention while the child peered up at the hills beside us, watching for the reappearance of the light. We reached the point where the line on my map intersected with what appeared to be our present road, without seeing a sign of it. I tried the next uphill turning. It took about half an hour to get back to the road again from the chalk pit into which it led us. We ran on further along the lower road. Then Susan caught a glimmer between the branches to our right. The next turning was luckier. It took us back at a slant up the side of the hill, until we were able to see a small, brilliantly lit square of window half a mile or more along the slope. Even then, and with the map to help, it was not easy to find the lane that led to it. We lurched along, still climbing in low gear, but each time we caught sight of the window again it was a little closer. The lane had not been designed for ponderous lorries. In the narrower parts we had to push our way along it between bushes and brambles which scrabbled along the sides as though they were trying to pull us back. But at last there was a lantern waving in the road ahead. It moved on, swinging to show us the turn through a gate. Then it was set stationary on the ground. I drove to within a yard or two of it and stopped. As I opened the door, a flashlight shone suddenly into my eyes. 
I had a glimpse of a figure behind it in a raincoat, shining with wetness. A slight break marred the intended calm of the voice that spoke. Hello, Bill. You've been a long time. I jumped down. Oh, Bill, I can't... Oh, my dear, I've been hoping so much. Oh, Bill, said Josella. I had forgotten all about Susan until a voice came from above. You are getting wet, you silly. Why don't you kiss her indoors? it asked. Chapter 14 Shurning The sense with which I arrived at Shurning Farm, the one that told me that most of my troubles were now over, is interesting only in showing how wide of the mark a sense can be. The sweeping of Josella into my arms went off pretty well, but its corollary of carrying her away forthwith to join the others at Tynesham did not, for several reasons. Ever since her possible location had occurred to me, I had pictured her in, I must admit, a rather cinematic way, as battling bravely against all the forces of nature, etc., etc. In a fashion, I suppose she was, but the setup was a lot different from my imaginings. My simple plan of saying, jump aboard, we're off to join Coker and his little gang, had to go by the board. One might have known that things would not turn out so simply. On the other hand, it is surprising how often the better thing is disguised as the worse. Not that I didn't from the start prefer Shurning to the thought of Tynesham, but to join a larger group was obviously a sounder move. But Shurning was charming. The word farm had become a courtesy title for the place. It had been a farm until some twenty-five years before, and it still looked like a farm, but in reality it had become a country house. Sussex and the neighbouring counties were well dotted with such houses and cottages, which tired Londoners had found adaptable to their needs. Internally, the house had been modernised and reconstructed to a point where it was doubtful whether its previous tenants would be able to recognise a single room. Outside, it had become spick. The yards and sheds had a suburban rather than a rural tidiness, and had for years known no form of animal life rougher than a few riding horses and ponies. The farmyard showed no utilitarian sights, and gave forth no rustic smells. It had been laid over with close green turf like a bowling green. The fields across which the windows of the house gazed from beneath weathered red tiles had long been worked by the occupiers of other and more earthly farmhouses. But the sheds and barns remained in good condition. It had been the ambition of Gisela's friends, the present owners, to restore the place one day to work on a limited scale, and to this end they had continually refused tempting offers for it in the hope that at some time, and in some manner not clearly perceived, they would acquire enough money to start buying back the land rightfully belonging to it. With its own well and its own power plant, the place had plenty to recommend it. But as I looked it over, I understood Coker's wisdom in speaking of a cooperative effort. I knew nothing of farming, but I could feel that if we had intended to stay there, it would take a lot of work to feed six of us. The other three had been there already when Josella had arrived. They were Dennis and Mary Brent and Joyce Taylor. Dennis was the owner of the house. Joyce had been there on an indefinite visit, at first to keep Mary company, and then to keep the house running when Mary's expected baby should be born. On the night of the green flashes, of the comet, you would say, if you were one who still believes in that comet. There had been two other guests, Joan and Ted Danton, spending a week's holiday there. All five of them had gone out into the garden to watch the display. In the morning, all five awoke to a world that was perpetually dark. First they had tried to telephone. When they found that impossible, they waited hopefully for the arrival of the daily help. She, too, failing them, Ted had volunteered to try and find out what had happened. Dennis would have accompanied him but for his wife's almost hysterical state. Ted, therefore, had set out alone. He did not come back. At some time later in the day, and without saying a word to anyone, Joan had slipped off, presumably to try and find her husband. She, too, disappeared completely. Dennis had kept track of time by touching the hands of the clock. By late afternoon it was impossible to sit any longer doing nothing. 
He wanted to try to get down to the village. Both the women had objected to that. Because of Mary's state, he had yielded, and Joyce determined to try. She went to the door and began to feel her way with a stick outstretched before her. She was barely over the threshold when something fell with a swish across her left hand, burning like a hot wire. She jumped back with a cry and collapsed in the hall where Dennis had found her. Luckily she was conscious, and able to moan of the pain in her hand. Dennis, feeling the raised wheel, had guessed it for what it was. In spite of their blindness, he and Mary had somehow contrived to apply hot fermentations, she heating the kettle while he put on a tourniquet and did his best to suck out the poison. After that, they had had to carry her up to bed, where she stayed for several days, while the effect of the poison wore off. Meanwhile, Dennis had made tests, first at the front and then at the back of the house. With the door slightly open, he cautiously thrust out a broom at head level. Each time there was the whistle of a sting, and he felt the broom handle tremble slightly in his grip. At one of the garden windows the same thing happened. The others seemed to be clear. He would have tried to leave by one of them but for Mary's distress. She was sure that if there were Triffids close round the house there must be others about, and would not let him take the risk. Luckily they had food enough to last them some time, though it was difficult to prepare it. Also Joyce, in spite of a high temperature, appeared to be holding her own against the Triffid poison, so that the situation was less urgent than it might have been. Most of the next day, Dennis devoted to contriving a kind of helmet for himself. He had wire net only of large mesh, so that he had to construct it of several layers overlapped and tied together. It took him some time, but equipped with this and a pair of heavy gauntlet gloves, he was able to start out for the village late in the day. A triffid had struck at him before he was three paces away from the house. He groped for it until he found it, and twisted its stem for it. A minute or two later another sting thudded across his helmet. He could not find that triffid to grapple with it, though it made half a dozen slashes before it gave up. He found his way to the tool shed and thence across to the lane, encumbered now with three large balls of gardening twine which he paid out as he went to guide him back. Several times in the lane more stings whipped at him. It took an immensely long time for him to cover the mile or so to the village, and before he reached it his supply of twine had given out. And all the time he had walked and stumbled through a silence so complete that it frightened him. Now and then he would stop and call, but no one answered. More than once he was afraid that he had lost his way, but when his feet discovered a better laid road surface he knew where he was and was able to confirm it by locating a signpost. He groped his way further on. After a seemingly vast distance, he had become aware that his footsteps were sounding differently. They had a faint echo. Moving to one side, he found a footpath, and then a wall. A little further along, he discovered a postbox let into the brickwork, and he knew that he must be actually in the village at last. He called out once more. A voice, a woman's voice, called back, but it was some distance ahead and the words were indistinguishable. He called again and began to move towards it. Its reply was suddenly cut off by a scream. After that, there was silence again. Only then, and still half incredulously, did he realise that the village was in no better plight than his own household. He sat down on the grass verge of the path to think out what he should do. By the feeling in the air he thought that night must have come. He must have been away fully four hours, and there was nothing to do but go back. All the same, there was no reason why he should go back empty-handed. With his stick he wrapped his way along the wall until it rang on one of the tin-plate advertisements which adorned the village shop. Three times in the last fifty or sixty yards stings had slapped on his helmet. Another struck as he opened the gate, and he tripped over a body lying on the path. A man's body, quite cold. He had the impression that there had been others in the shop before him. Nevertheless, he found a sizable piece of bacon. He dropped it, along with packets of butter or margarine, biscuits and sugar, into a sack, and added an assortment of tins which came from a shelf that, to the best of his recollection, was devoted to food. The sardine tins, at any rate, were unmistakable. Then he sought for and found a dozen or more balls of string, 
shouldered his sack and set off for home. He had missed his way once, and it had been hard to keep down panic while he retraced his steps and reorientated himself. But at last he knew that he was again in the familiar lane. By groping right across it, he managed to locate the twine of his outward journey and join it to the string. From there, the rest of the journey back had been comparatively easy. Twice more in the week that followed, he had made the journey to the village shop again, and each time the triffids round the house and on the way had seemed more numerous. There had been nothing for the isolated trio to do but wait in hope. And then, like a miracle, Josella had arrived. It was clear at once then that the notion of an immediate move to Tynesham was out. For one thing, Joyce Taylor was still in an extremely weak state. When I looked at her, I was surprised that she was alive at all. Dennis's promptness had saved her life, but their inability to give her the proper restoratives or even suitable food during the following week had slowed down her recovery. It would be folly to try to move her a long distance for a week or two yet. And then, too, Mary's confinement was close enough to make the journey inadvisable for her, so that the only course seemed to be for us all to remain where we were until these crises should have passed. Once more it became my task to scrounge and forage. This time I had to work on a more elaborate scale to include not merely food but petrol for the lighting system, hens that were laying, two cows that had recently calved and still survived though their ribs were sticking out, medical necessities for Mary, and a surprising list of sundries. The area was more beset with triffids than any other I had yet seen. Almost every morning revealed one or two new ones lurking close to the house, and the first task of the day was to shoot the tops off them, until I had constructed a netting fence to keep them out of the garden. Even then they would come right up and loiter suggestively against it until something was done about them. I opened some of the cases of gear, and taught young Susan how to use a triffid gun. She quite rapidly became an expert at disarming the things, as she continued to call them. It became her department to work daily vengeance on them. From Josella, I learnt what had happened to her after the fire alarm at the university building. She had been shipped off with her party much as I with mine, but her manner of dealing with the two women to whom she was attached had been summary. She had issued a flat ultimatum. Either she became free of all restraints, in which case she would help them as far as she was able, or if they continued to coerce her, there would be likely to come a time when they would find themselves drinking prussic acid or eating cyanide of potassium on her recommendation. They could take their choice. They had chosen sensibly. There was little difference in what we had to tell one another about the days that had followed. When her group had in the end dissolved, she had reasoned much as I did. She took a car and went up to Hampstead to look for me. She had not encountered any survivors from my group, nor run across that led by the quick-triggered red-headed man. She had kept on there until almost sunset, and then decided to make for the university building. Not knowing what to expect, she had cautiously stopped the car a couple of streets away and approached on foot. When she was still some distance from the gates, she heard a shot. Wondering what that might indicate, she had taken cover in the garden that had sheltered us before. From there she had observed Coker also making a circumspect advance. Without knowing that I had fired at the Triffid in the square, and that the sound of the shot was the cause of Coker's caution, she suspected some kind of trap. Determined not to fall into one a second time, she had returned to the car. She had no idea where the rest had gone if they had gone at all. The only place of refuge she could think of that would be known to anyone at all was the one she had mentioned almost casually to me. She had decided to make for it in the hope that I, if I was still in existence, would remember and try to find it. I curled up and slept in the back of the car once I was clear of London, she said. It was still quite early when I got here the next morning. The sound of the car brought Dennis to an upstairs window, warning me to look out for Triffids. Then I saw that there were half a dozen or more of them close around the house, for all the world as if they were waiting for someone to come out of it. Dennis and I shouted back and forth. The Triffids stirred, and one of them began to move towards me, so I nipped back into the car for safety. When it kept on coming, I started up the car and deliberately ran it down. 
but there were still the others, and I had no kind of weapon but my knife. It was Dennis who solved that difficulty. If you have a can of petrol to spare, throw some of it their way and follow it up with a bit of burning rag, he suggested. That ought to shift them. It did. Since then I've been using a garden syringe. The wonder is that I've not set the place on fire. With the aid of a cookbook, Gisela had managed to produce meals of a kind and had set about putting the place more or less to rights. Working, learning and improvising had kept her too busy to worry about a future which lay beyond the next few weeks. She had seen no one else at all during those days. But certain that there must be others somewhere, she had scanned the whole valley for signs of smoke by day or lights by night. She had seen no smoke, and in all the miles within her view, there had not been a gleam of light until the evening I came. In a way, the worst affected of the original trio was Dennis. Joyce was still weak and in a semi-invalid state. Mary held herself withdrawn and seemed capable of finding endless mental occupation and compensation in the contemplation of prospective motherhood. But Dennis was like an animal in a trap. He did not curse in the futile way I had heard so many others do. He resented it with a vicious bitterness, as if it had forced him into a cage where he did not intend to stay. Already before I arrived, he had prevailed upon Gisela to find the Braille system in the encyclopedia and make an indented copy of the alphabet for him to learn. He spent dogged hours each day making notes in it and attempting to read them back. Most of the rest of the time he fretted over his own uselessness though he scarcely mentioned it. He would keep on trying to do this or that with a grim persistence that was painful to watch, and it required all my self-control to stop me offering him help. One experience of the bitterness which unasked help could arouse in him was quite enough. I began to be astonished at the things he was painfully teaching himself to do, though still the most impressive to me was his construction of an efficient mesh helmet on only the second day of his blindness. It took him out of himself to accompany me on some of my foraging expeditions, and it pleased him that he could be useful in helping to move the heavier cases. He was anxious for books in Braille, but these, we decided, would have to wait until there was less risk of contamination in towns large enough to be likely sources. The days began to pass quickly, certainly for the three of us who could see. Josella was kept busy mostly in the house, and Susan was learning to help her. There were plenty of jobs, too, waiting to be done by me. Joyce recovered sufficiently to make a shaky first appearance, and then began to pick up more rapidly. Soon after that, Mary's pains began. That was a bad night for everyone. Worst, perhaps, for Dennis, in knowing that everything depended on the care of two willing but inexperienced girls. His self-control aroused my helpless admiration. In the early hours of the morning, Josella came down to us, looking very tired. It's a girl. They're both all right, she said, and led Dennis up. She returned a few moments later and took the drink I had ready for her. It was quite simple, thank heaven, she said. Poor Mary was horribly afraid it might be blind too, but of course it's not. Now she's crying quite dreadfully because she can't see it. We drank. It's queer, I said, the way things go on, I mean. Like a seed. It looks all shriveled and finished. You think it was dead, but it isn't. And now a new life starting, coming into all this? Gisela put her face in her hands. Oh, God. Bill, does it have to go on being like this? On and on and on. And she, too, collapsed in tears. Three weeks later, I went over to Tynesham to see Coca and make arrangements for our move. I took an ordinary car in order to do the double journey in a day. When I got back, Josella met me in the hall. She gave one look at my face. What's the matter? she said. Just that we shan't be going there after all, I told her. Tynesham is finished. She stared back at me. What happened? I'm not sure. It looks as if the plague got there. I described the state of affairs briefly. It had not needed much investigation. The gates were open when I arrived, 
and the sight of Triffids loose in the park half warned me what to expect. The smell when I got out of the car confirmed it. I made myself go into the house. By the look of it, it had been deserted two weeks or more before. I put my head into two of the rooms. They were enough for me. I called, and my voice ran right away through the hollowness of the house. I went no further.